Midwest City is just a few miles east of Oklahoma City in Oklahoma, the United States. It was founded during World War II to serve as the home of Tinker Air Force Base. Over the years, it's grown into a close-knit community, one that takes pride in its military history and its laid-back suburban atmosphere. But beneath that calm exterior, Midwest City harboured a dark secret, a crime so disturbing that it's largely faded into obscurity, with little written about it in the years since. On the 5th of May, 1977, police were dispatched to an unassuming apartment after receiving a phone call from a concerned neighbour. Theodore Canadis hadn't been seen in a couple of days. While he kept to himself, it was still very unlike him. The officers knocked on the apartment door several times, but there was no answer. When they noticed an upstairs window slightly ajar, they decided to enter. What they found inside was far beyond anything they could have ever imagined. The scene was so gruesome that it was later compared to a slaughterhouse. Gregory Canadis had once lived a very ordinary childhood. He was born in Wichita, Kansas on the 17th of November, 1956, the second child of three boys to Theodore and Betty. The family stayed here until Gregory was two years old, following which they moved to Okinawa. Gregory's father, Theodore, had spent 20 years in the Air Force as a jet engine mechanic, which meant that he often spent a lot of times overseas. He was stationed in Vietnam in the 1960s, and upon his return he and Betty called it quits on their marriage. Gregory moved with his mother to Hawaii, where she eventually remarried. He got on well with his stepfather, who was a photographer, and they did things together as a family. Gregory loved to draw and spent his day surfing the waves off the coast. As for Theodore, he moved over to Midwest City in Oklahoma. Gregory once said of him, he was all right as a person, but he had a bad temper a lot of the time. Life seemed stable enough, at least at first. Gregory was in regular classes at high school, except for special reading classes. As he explained, I was a slow reader. But as Gregory grew older, the shadows of his mind darkened. By his teenage years, he struggled more and more with his mental health spiralling into bouts of confusion and erratic behaviour. He was expelled from school in his junior year for smoking marijuana at school. But then in the fall of 1976, everything changed. At 19 years old, Gregory had found himself homeless after his mother asked him to leave their home. She had become overwhelmed by his increasingly unpredictable nature and didn't feel comfortable with him living there. According to a psychiatrist's report, there were allegations of sexual abuse between Gregory and his mother, but this was never substantiated. Gregory denied the sexual abuse, and so did his mother. With the changes in his life, Gregory tried to grasp onto the normalcy slipping through his fingers. He even proposed to his girlfriend, Patricia Browning. She would later reflect. He was just a beautiful young man. He just started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. With nowhere else to go, Gregory left Hawaii and travelled to the mainland, to Midwest City in Oklahoma, where his father, Theodore, welcomed him into his apartment. Theodore had since retired from the US Air Force and now worked maintenance at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. For Gregory, it was an attempt at a fresh start. Tragically, however, his struggles didn't fade with the change in scenery. In January of 1977, Gregory was admitted to St. Anthony Hospital after attempting suicide by slashing his wrists and ankles. He had changed his mind about suicide, and his father had found him in the bathtub bleeding out, but trying to stem the bleeding. He told the psychiatrist that he was trying to let the bad blood out. 
at the hospital, Gregory said of his suicide attempt. There was nothing to do and I was thinking about my friends, but I couldn't go back to Hawaii Kau High School because there were a lot of bad guys after me. He didn't elaborate other than to say that one man had pointed a gun at him. He said, I didn't tell anybody, but it looked funny. Gregory later said that he planned on slitting his own throat, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He stayed at the hospital for more than two months and he later said that he had fond memories of his stay. He recollected. The food was good. Ever since I've been in Oklahoma, life has been bad. Nothing to do. I'm depressed and sad. Gregory hadn't made any friends in Oklahoma, but he bonded with people at the hospital. Once released, Gregory returned once more to his father's apartment. He was a broken man teetering on the edge of sanity. In early May of 1977, neighbours of Theodore Canadis had begun to grow uneasy. Theodore was a quiet man who kept himself to himself, but it wasn't like him to vanish for days yet nobody had seen him or heard from him. By the 5th of May, their concern had deepened. One of the neighbours had knocked on Theodore's door, only to be greeted by his teenage son, Gregory. Gregory claimed that his father was in the hospital, but when they called around to local medical centres, nobody had a record of a Theodore being admitted. On the 7th of May, Neighbours couldn't ignore the gnawing sense of dread any longer. They were fully aware that Theodore's son, Gregory, had mental health problems, and they were concerned. They contacted the police and requested a welfare check. Officers Steve Taylor and Phil Anderson were dispatched to investigate. Pulling up outside Theodore's apartment, both officers immediately noticed that. Unlike the other lit-up apartments, Theodore's was shrouded in darkness. The curtains were drawn and the street was uncomfortably quiet. When the officers knocked on the front door, nobody answered. Given the circumstances, their supervisor authorised them to enter the apartment by any means necessary. Taylor and Anderson headed to the back of the building where they noticed a second-floor window with the curtains billowing slightly in the night breeze. The window was partially open, just above a narrow catwalk. Officer Taylor recalled, We put a nearby picnic table onto the window, a brick block on the table. Then I helped Anderson up and he helped me in. Once inside, the dim lighting did little to mask the gruesome scene that awaited the officers. The air was dense with the coppery smell of blood mixed with a sharp, acrid odour that stung their nostrils. Their eyes immediately landed on blood. A lot of it. It smeared the walls, streaking the floors and even splattered across the ceiling. Officer Taylor later said, We immediately saw all the blood everywhere and pulled out our guns. In the master bedroom, the true horror began to unravel for the two officers. The bed was drenched in blood and a bloodied pair of underwear lay discarded on the floor. Taylor and Anderson exchanged tense glances as they scanned the room further. Two dresser drawers and a closet were saturated in blood as well. When they opened them up, They were filled with guts that looked suspiciously human-like. The trail continued down the hallway, leading to the bathroom. A bloodstained knife rested on the edge of the tub, and the entire room was streaked in red from the sink to the floor. Officer Taylor recalled, We said quietly to each other, because we didn't know whether the guy was still downstairs, that we've got a murder for sure, and probably a dissected body. Their dread mounted as they slowly followed the trail of blood down a spiral staircase. The living room was faintly lit, but it wasn't enough. 
the officers switched on the overhead light and what they saw turned their stomachs. More blood. More than they could have imagined. It directed them towards the kitchen. There, in the dim glow, they found the worst of it all. There was a large puddle of blood that concentrated around the refrigerator. Smeared across the stainless steel door of the fridge was bloody handprints. Officer Taylor reached out, hesitating for a moment then slowly pulling open the door. Inside was a sight that made them recoil in horror. It was Theodore, or at least what was left of him. Portions of his body were arranged on the shelves, some grotesquely displayed, others haphazardly thrown in. Officer Taylor later recounted, I used to work in a mortuary, but I've never seen flesh like that before. The grisly scene made his stomach turn. Blood coated the floors and the place reeked of death. The worst part, however was the sight of flesh that had been carved from the body. It looked like a slaughterhouse. Some of the pieces of flesh had been cooked, cut into steak-sized portions and laid neatly on a tray. Taylor couldn't help but notice that some pieces still had hair on them, clearly taken from Theodore's arms or legs. Lying amidst the grotesque remains was a single fork, stained with congealed blood. In the freezer, they found Theodore's hands, severed at the wrist and stacked with cold precision. On a nearby skillet, there was even more human flesh. With the apartment too dangerous to explore further, Taylor and his partner radioed for backup, unsure if the killer was still hiding somewhere inside. As the scene outside the apartment was cordoned off with crime scene tape, Detectives focused their efforts on finding Gregory. He was their immediate suspect. They were aware of his troubled history and the fact that he had been living with his father before claiming that his father was in hospital. As the officers gathered outside to regroup, somebody spotted a figure moving in the bushes near the back door. It was Gregory. He had been hiding there all along likely having escaped through the open window the officers had found earlier. Officer Taylor later reflected. He must have been watching us from the bushes all that time. If we had gone the other way first, we probably would have caught him. Upon his arrest, Gregory made no denials that he was the person that detectives were looking for. He immediately made a full confession that was disturbing in its detail. He admitted that he had killed his father, Theodore, four days prior, following a heated argument about his inability to find a job. His father had been frustrated with his son's reliance on him for support. With no extra money to give, Theodore had pushed Gregory to take responsibility for his own life. The argument had escalated quickly, and Gregory told detectives that, in a moment of rage, he grabbed a rock and struck his father on the head. According to Gregory, he had brought the rock inside a few days earlier, just in case he and his father got into an argument. He then followed the initial blow by stabbing his father repeatedly. But the horror didn't end there. Gregory revealed that after killing his father, he had consumed part of his body, specifically part of his head. Over the next four days, he continued to cannibalise his father's remains, slicing portions of flesh and muscle from the body and then cooking them. His confession shocked the detectives as he described calmly how he had spent those days eating pieces of his father's body. Once taken to the jail cell, Gregory's disturbing behaviour persisted. He spoke openly with the guards about his actions, even going as far to explain that he had dismembered his father's body to avoid wasting good meat. His lack of remorse and his matter-of-fact manner deeply unsettled the guards. Hours later, during a routine check, the guards discovered that Gregory had smuggled a bloody pocket knife into his cell and had been hiding it under his mattress. 
it appeared that he had concealed the weapon in a body orifice. Along with the discovery of the knife, the guards also noticed that Gregory had numerous minor cuts on his arms, legs and genital area. When questioned about the injuries, Gregory claimed they had been caused by his father during their fatal altercation. However, after being examined by a doctor, it became clear that the wounds were in fact self-inflicted. Gregory was booked in on a charge of first-degree murder. He appeared in court the next day, where Judge Creston Williamson ordered him to be committed to Central State Griffin Hospital in Norman for 60 days. The order had been requested by Gregory's public defender, Garvin Isaacs. He said that when he met with Gregory, he appeared to be confused and disoriented, and said that there was no way he would be able to assist in his own defence. According to defence attorney Isaacs, he would hallucinate. It just broke my heart, the whole thing, per guy. He later said that Gregory had smuggled the knife in and had caused the injuries to himself. The worst of the injuries were to his own genital area. He recalled. There was blood going everywhere. They called the ambulance. I knew then, this kid was crazy. After the brief court hearing, Gregory was bundled into a police van and driven to the hospital 20 miles south. As he arrived at the hospital, detectives announced that they were looking into the possibility that he was involved in another murder. Just the year beforehand, an unidentified woman was discovered dead in an abandoned home in Oklahoma City. She had been found in a condition very much like Theodore, having been surgically dismembered with several organs missing. However, detectives could never find any connection between the two cases. The body found in the abandoned home would eventually be identified as Kathy Shackelford, and she was the first victim of the Oklahoma City Butcher. This unidentified serial killer murdered three homeless Native American women and was never identified. During Gregory's session with Dr. Lorraine Schmidt at the psychiatric hospital, he shared a fragmented view of his life before the murder of his father. When he first sat down, he spoke casually about his physical injuries, downplaying the situation. He said, I had cuts on my arms, leg and stomach. They thought I needed treatment. But the conversation soon shifted to the real reason for his stay, the brutal murder of his father. He confessed, Me and my father got into a big fight and I ended up killing him with a big knife. His tone was detached as though he were recounting a distant memory. He went on to describe how, after the fight, he left the apartment. When he returned, his father was dead. He said, I didn't know what to do. I was so scared about it. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know the roads. He added that if he had known the area better, he might have escaped and avoided getting caught altogether. As he delved deeper into the events leading up to the murder, Gregory painted a picture of a tense relationship. He said, I told him I didn't want to sit around this place all of my life. He said, don't worry about it, you'll get a job. But that reassurance quickly turned into more complaints, according to Gregory. He said that his father fussed about the constant mess in the apartment accusing him of being lazy and not carrying out the trash. Gregory said, He said the house stank because of me. He was always snapping at me, and then he'd be real nice. Gregory expressed frustration with his inability to find a job, partly due to not having a car. But he admitted that the only place he actually applied for was a local pizza store. His days were monotonous, spent sitting in the apartment while his father went to work. The resentment built as his father frequently complained about Gregory eating all the food, although his father still gave him money from time to time. Their arguments, Gregory admitted, were frequent, but never escalated to such violence until that fateful day. 
He recalled his father's strange habits with food, describing how he would buy lousy food like chicken, keep it in the fridge for weeks and then still eat it. He told the psychiatrist. He also bought loads of noodles and kept them on the stove for days, then ate them even after they'd gone off. Dr. Schmidt listened intently, absorbing Gregory's disjointed narrative. Gregory said that he often refused to eat the bad food, but this annoyed his father, who would ask, Isn't this good enough for you? Gregory's chilling confession to the doctor only grew more grotesque as he spoke of the murder and its aftermath. He said the situation escalated quickly, and although Gregory insisted he hadn't intended to kill his father, he admitted that he spotted a butcher knife that Theodore had just purchased that day. Grabbing it in a fit of anger, Gregory said he tried to beat his father off with it. When his father fell to the ground, things took a darker turn. Gregory confessed that he stabbed his father in the throat before fleeing from the apartment in panic. When he returned later and found his father dead, Gregory explained that he feared getting into trouble. His mind raced, and in a desperate bid to conceal his crime, he decided to dismember his father's body. Gregory's description of the dismemberment was horrifyingly clinical. He said he placed Theodore's guts in a dresser drawer, cut out what meat he could from the bones and then stored it in the fridge. Over the next four days, he began cooking and eating his father's remains. I was so angry with him, Gregory recalled with an eerie calm. He then added, I chewed him up. It made me stronger. He described that the flesh tasted like beef and said that it wasn't difficult to consume his father. It never crossed my mind that anybody would find out, he said. But Gregory didn't stop there. He boiled his father's heart and ate it, telling Dr. Schmidt, it kept my father's spirit alive. Gregory also admitted to stuffing fat, bones and guts into garbage bags, which he then threw into the apartment's dumpster. As for the flesh, he either boiled or baked it, and said he consumed nearly 30 pounds of his father's remains over the course of those four days. As Gregory recounted the police arriving at the apartment, he said that he never actually expected them to show up. When they knocked on the door, he said he slipped through a window and hid in the bushes, where officers eventually found him. Despite the horrific nature of his actions, Gregory remained emotionless. When asked if he felt remorse, he simply shrugged it off. I didn't feel bad about eating my father, he said bluntly. As he said, he was already dead. In June of 1977, it was announced that Gregory had been determined to be legally insane. He had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was also suffering from hallucinations. He told psychiatrists that he frequently heard his brother's voice and had even saw his face. According to a psychiatrist's report, Subject does exhibit abnormal emotional behaviour, which is quite primitive in some respects. At present, he is partially compensated to the point of using more evasiveness and denial. The report said that Gregory had bizarre type behaviour, in which he was verbal but withdrawn, and looked to the floor constantly. He also constantly bit his fingernails, picked his nose and ate the pickings. He also frequently masturbated openly on the ward. The report concluded, He is considered overtly psychotic at this time. There's no evidence of organic brain disorder. As a result, Gregory was committed to Central State Hospital, where he was to remain until he was deemed sane. The case made little progress over the following months. Then in November of the following year, Gregory's defence attorney, Garvin Isaacs, filed a $2 million lawsuit against St. Anthony Hospital and Dr. Sam Collins, alleging negligence. According to the lawsuit, the hospital had released Gregory after a suicide attempt just a couple of months before the murder, but they had failed to recognise the dangers that he posed. 
Isaacs argued that this negligence contributed to Theodore's tragic death. The lawsuit was eventually dismissed, but not without controversy. The following year, P. L. Browning, the administrator of Theodore's estate, petitioned the Supreme Court to reverse the dismissal. Browning's argument was damning. He said Gregory had been released into his father's care without any warning about his violent tendencies. He cited the California Supreme Court's 1974 decision, which established that doctors must warn potential victims if their patients pose a foreseeable danger. The petition read in part, As a result of this improper treatment and the failure to warn the father, Theodore Canadis was killed. Despite the legal battles, Gregory remained at Central State Hospital under constant supervision. He was still considered insane, unable to assist in his defence, and had shown no improvement. In May of 1980, however, the legal landscape shifted. A June preliminary hearing was ordered, sparked by a groundbreaking ruling in January of that year. U.S. District Judge Luther Eubanks had found Oklahoma's criminal commitment statutes unconstitutional. According to the judge, the statutes violated the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. Under the old laws, someone deemed mentally incompetent could indefinitely be committed to a state hospital without further judicial review. The civil commitment statutes, on the other hand, allowed for release when a person was no longer considered a danger to themselves or others. Judge Eubanks ruled that individuals, such as Gregory, deserve the right to a hearing before being committed. This hearing would allow them to cross-examine witnesses and challenge the findings of incompetence. Gregory had been declared insane without ever having the chance for such a hearing a stark violation of his constitutional rights. Now, with the June hearing approaching, the question of Gregory's legal fate hung in the balance. On the 7th of June, 1980, Gregory stood before the Oklahoma County Court in a committal hearing alongside his defence attorney, Garvin Isaacs. The hearing was crucial in determining Gregory's fate after years of being deemed legally insane. His mother, Betty, had filed a petition for his commitment under civil statutes, and Isaacs announced that he had aligned with the district attorney's office in supporting the civil commitment motion. Betty had gone to visit her son regularly in the psychiatric hospital, and she worried about his condition. In a letter, she had expressed her concern writing, He has a very wild look in his eyes, and he's confused and extremely dull. I've never seen him look so bad. Gregory had been in maximum security for some time after he told some visiting high school students about what he had done. Understandably, it terrified them. There had also been some rumours that Gregory had been leaving the grounds and sneaking back in before the morning. During the court hearing, Isaacs explained that everyone involved in the case agreed on Gregory's condition. He was truly insane. Their primary concern was sparing Gregory and his family further hardship. Isaacs remarked, Greg is embarrassed by having to come to court and his family's embarrassed, so we joined the motion. This motion led to the dismissal of the murder charge against Gregory and he was once more ordered to be committed to a psychiatric facility. Isaacs expressed his belief that Gregory would likely remain at Central State Hospital for the rest of his life, somberly stating, I don't think there's any chance of him ever recovering. Following the hearing, Assistant District Attorney Arlene Joplin weighed in, noting that while the murder charge had been dismissed, it could be refiled if Gregory were ever declared sane. She emphasised that this decision was made to ensure public safety and proper treatment for Gregory. She explained, We decided that this is the most expeditious way of making sure that he is going to be kept someplace where the safety of the public can be protected and he can be treated.
In May of 1995, nearly two decades after Gregory was first institutionalised, there was an unexpected development. Prosecutors announced that they were considering refiling the murder charge against Gregory after learning that he had been released from the psychiatric hospital and was living unsupervised in the community. Reports varied, with some suggesting that Gregory had been released two years earlier, while others said that it had only been two weeks. Regardless, prosecutors hadn't been informed at the time. Gregory had been living as an outpatient in Norman and working as a grocery store packer in a local store. District Attorney Tim Kukendall expressed his concern, stating, We didn't think that it was appropriate. He argued that if Gregory was functioning in the community, he should be deemed competent to assist in his defence. This raised questions about whether Gregory after so many years in psychiatric care, was now mentally fit to face the charges he had evaded due to insanity back in 1977. However, Gregory's former defence attorney, Garvin Isaacs, strongly disagreed. He argued that Gregory remained unfit to stand trial, pointing to the severe mental illness that had plagued him at the time of the murder. In his comments, Isaacs said, He was insane at the time he killed his father. Anybody that saw the boy and was around him knows that he was truly a sick boy. In the end, authorities decided not to refile the murder charges, citing the persistent instability of Gregory's mental health. However, he was returned to Griffin Memorial Hospital, where it was determined that he would remain indefinitely. In 2006, the Daily Oklahoman revisited the case of Gregory Canadis, revealing that he was now being held at the Northwest Centre for Behavioural Health. Having left the psychiatric hospital in Norman in September of 2004, Gregory's life had remained largely out of the public eye. Despite the media attention the case once garnered, there was little new information available. While media had reported on the murder in the immediate aftermath, not much else had ever been written. Bound by law, state officials couldn't discuss Gregory or other patients under their care. District Attorney Wesleyan made it clear that if Gregory were ever released, he would pursue charges related to the murder of his father. However, he acknowledged a significant challenge. He questioned, Where's the evidence? He expressed doubt about whether anything had been preserved from the 1980 dismissal of Gregory's case. He asked, What did they do way back when to preserve anything for us? Gregory's former defence attorney, Garvin Isaacs, hadn't seen him in over a decade, but he had vivid memories of his client. Isaacs recalled one particular day in the psychiatric hospital where Gregory was seen playing pool in the day room with a girl who called him Honey Bear. Isaacs reflected on Gregory's deep desire for release, remembering how he repeatedly said, I wish I could get out. For the first time, Isaacs revealed a disturbing detail that Gregory had shared with him. He had said that hawk eagles had commanded him to kill. Gregory explained that these creatures were the rulers in ancient civilizations and that their voices led him to murder. Isaac said, If he was on his meds, he was a very lovable, likable guy. But if he's off the Thorazine, look out. Patricia Browning, Gregory's former fiancé, echoed these sentiments. She had visited him in the psychiatric hospital for several years after his arrest. And while Gregory appeared docile, likely drugged, she believed that his delusions remained. He had told her that razor heads from Greece, who were hiding in the walls, had directed him to kill his father. She commented, He was very ill. I don't blame him for Ted's death. I don't blame him at all. In 2014, Gregory Canadis died of heart disease, aggravated by years of cigarette smoking. He was 57 years old 
and had spent 37 of those years in various psychiatric institutions. Though the outside world had largely forgotten him, Gregory's life behind hospital walls remained one of delusion and chaos until the very end. A doctor who had treated him noted, he still remained very delusional up until the very end. As the years passed, Gregory's case became an unsettling reminder of a crime too horrific to easily remember, yet too strange to forget. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I'd like to say a massive thank you to my newest supporter up on Patreon, Deirdre. I'd also like to share that I'm expecting my very first baby. I'm due in December, but nothing will be changing with Morbidology. I've somehow managed to get so far ahead to account for maternity leave, so episodes will still run weekly, unless, of course, something unexpected comes up. I'd just like to once more thank everybody for all of their support over the years. This podcast has enabled me to work from home full time, and as I transition into this new period of my life, I really couldn't be more thankful for all of you. Remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read some true crime articles. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week.